consciousness and soul life. If we compare Hegel's poem recited yesterday with Goethe's poem that you have just heard, it will help us understand more deeply the substance of yesterday's lecture as well as what remains to be discussed today. Footnote, Goethe's poem titled Thoughts About the Descent into Hell of Jesus Christ was recited at the beginning of this lecture. This poem has been omitted since it is quite long and adds little to the lecture itself. With a little imagination, it is not difficult to understand the point being made. End of footnote. A comparison will be useful since it can make us aware of the difference between the soul qualities of these two poets. Let us try to become aware of the very great difference between these two poems. Our time here is short, so we can do little more than touch on certain matters. I am certain, however, that we can come to understand them. Yesterday we listened to the poem of a philosopher, a man who had attained very exalted pure thought. In his poem Eloisis, we saw that thought itself became creative in Hegel's soul. If you recall how that poem affected you, you will say that you could sense its powerful thoughts wrestling with humankind's greatest questions, as well as the greatest problems of the times, which are linked to the so-called mysteries. <clears throat> you could feel that someone had penetrated deeply into those great cosmic mysteries with thinking, but you could feel a certain clumsiness in the poetic handling. You could feel in the poem that it contained something that did not arise from the primary goals in the poet's life. A struggle for poetic form was evident, a difficult struggle to adapt the thought to a suitable poetic form. One realizes that the writer would not have been able to write many poems in his lifetime. Let us compare that poem with the one you've just heard, but keep a certain circumstance in mind. I had a poem of the youthful Goethe read before the first lecture in this series, a poem we changed for our purposes here. It was a vivid demonstration of how two souls lived within Goethe's breast, two soul powers or forces. We saw the powerful images conjured up by the poem. What we heard was also worthy of what lived as the central core of Goethe's being during his old age. But in this youthful poem we see a completely different soul force was active within him than what was active, for instance, in Hegel. Wherever we look in Goethe we encounter something that may be described as a flow of intensely vivid images. And how full of images is this poem of the young Goethe that we have just heard? The flow of that vivid life of images was an aspect of Goethe's natural talent. When the grandeur of a theme overwhelmed him, we can see that a powerful soul life, living itself out in vivid imagery, overcame the problems that still disturbed him in his earlier poems. We can distinguish three elements in the poem recited. In Hegel we see how thinking works, creating imagery only through a tremendous struggle. This is evident in the paleness of his images. In the poem of the younger Goethe we see how the vivid pictures pour out. We saw in his legend of the title, The Eternal Jew, how that imaging could be so damaged that he was unable to finish it, the result of the two souls described which fought for dominance within him. The effort remained only a fragment. Our attention is drawn here to the myriad possible shapes of soul life. Let us consider for a moment the soul force we might characterize as oriented toward thinking, as it was for Hegel, one that experiences difficulty penetrating into that soul force that was uppermost in Goethe. And let us look at how this soul force in Goethe himself works into just the opposite tendency. We want to move forward now with our study of psychosophy. We remember that within the soul life, judging and the experiences of love and hate that stem from the capacity for desiring are active. Now, we can proceed in a different way than we did yesterday. 
We can bring together what lives in our souls as the power of judging by reminding ourselves, on the one hand, that this power meets us in the reasoning capacity of the soul, in the capacity to discern the truths of the world, and on the other hand that a completely different soul power confronts us when we speak of how the soul is, in this way or that, interested in the external world. <clears throat> a soul is interested in the outer world according to how the experiences of love and hate are working. The phenomena of love and hate themselves, however, have nothing to do with the thinking capacity, with the intelligence. The capacities to judge and to take an interest are two forces in the soul that work very differently from each other, as simple observation demonstrates. Those who believe that will is a special soul aspect will see through looking into their own souls that they meet only the interest in what is wanted. In other words, one discovers nothing in the innermost realm of the soul except the two elements of interest through love and hate and the capacity for judgment expressed in acts of judging. The entire content of one's soul life is summed up in these aspects. However, this leaves consciousness, the most important aspect of soul life, entirely out of the matter. Consciousness belongs to the soul life. In other words, when we explore the content of the soul life from all sides, we encounter the capacity for judging and interest. <clears throat> when we examine its inner uniqueness, however, the particulars of soul life, we must conclude that we may consider the experiences of love and hate and the capacity for judgment to be a part of the soul life only to the extent that we associate them with the word consciousness. We must ask, therefore, what is consciousness? Again, I will characterize rather than define. If we approach human consciousness with a background of the matters we have studied thus far, you would say, on the basis of the continuous stream of mental images you have been absorbing, that the conscious state does not coincide with soul life. As we have seen, there is a certain difference between soul life as such and awareness. A mental image formed days or weeks or years ago lives on in us, for it can be remembered. If, however, we cannot recall it at this moment, but perhaps only two days later, it has indeed continued to live within us, but unconsciously. That means that it is there, in the soul, but not in one's consciousness. Thus the soul's stream flows on, but consciousness is something different from this onward flowing stream of the soul. In short, we must say that if we represent the soul as a circle, and the imaginative pictures we can remember again at some time, as a stream flowing in the direction of the arrow, so it's a circle with an arrow pointed to the right going straight through the center, this stream can contain all mental images that flow in a person's soul from the past into the future. In order for them to become conscious, however, a striving must lift them from their unconscious life within the soul into consciousness. Consciousness, therefore, belongs to the soul but not in the sense that everything in the soul is within the realm of consciousness. The stream of mental images flows on, but consciousness illuminates only a certain part of the soul life at a given moment. Since we are in contact with others and must be prepared for objections, let me add a parenthesis. Someone might object that what I've called the quote-unquote stream of mental images is simply the disposition of the soul or brain that, once created, remains. It could also be said that the only thing required is that the disposition of the brain be illuminated by consciousness at a certain moment. That would, in fact, be true if it were unnecessary to separate something from a perception immediately after its reception, so that one could perpetuate it. If the disposition were to be made into a memory by the perception, nothing would have to be released from the whole process. 
nor would the perception need to be transformed into a mental image. The perception arises from the external object, but that is not true of the mental image. The mental image is a response outward from within. We have retained within our within us our experience of the world, which continues to flow from the past into the future with the stream of time. But it does not always coincide with consciousness. In order to recall it, consciousness must illuminate it. <clears throat> How does it happen that this continuous stream of mental images in the soul can be illuminated so that parts of it become visible to memory or in some other way? A fact of ordinary soul life that takes place on the physical plane can explain this. It is a fact that is ignored by outer psychology since its criterion is bias rather than fact. We prefer to work instead with fact, without bias. Human beings possess a tremendous variety of feelings. I will point to just a few, some of which were mentioned yesterday, and a few others. Feelings, for example, that express themselves in longing, impatience, hope, doubt, anxiety, and fear. What do all of these various feelings tell us? If we examine them closely, we find that they all share a peculiar element. They are all related to the future, something that may happen or something that we hope will happen. In our souls we live in such a way that our feelings are interested not only in the present, but also in the future. In fact, they have a very lively interest in the future. Furthermore, the fact that such future-oriented feelings live in us may be compared to something else. <clears throat> Try to recall an experience of joy or sorrow that you had as a young person, or perhaps that you only more recently experienced. Now, try to compare for a moment what lives in your feelings from the past of pain that you have gotten over or joy that you have experienced. You can see how extremely pale the summoned memory appears. If it left a mark behind, affected your health or something else, for example, it asserts itself and pushes into your awareness, but that is in the present. What we experience in the past in connection with our feeling life, pales the more we distance ourselves from it. Now let us turn to what is clearly desiring. When you desire something that is attainable in the future, try to carefully define the rumblings in your soul. I would like to know how many people are now lamenting a disappointment from ten years ago, unless such longing has continued and is creating a sense of deprivation now. There is a vast difference between our interest in what lies behind and what lies ahead of us. Regardless of how hard we look, there is only one explanation for this. The fact itself is plain, but the only explanation is that desiring flows in the opposite direction for the forward-flowing stream of mental images. You can cast something like a flash of lightning on your soul life by assuming that one fact. All desires, wishes and interests, the phenomena of love and hate, represent a current in the soul life that flows not from past to future, but toward us from the future. It flows from the future into the past. Suddenly, the totality of soul experience is clear. It would take days to go further into this matter, so I will just add the following points. If you assume that the stream of love and hate, of desires and so on, comes toward a person from the future and encounters the current of mental images previously characterized, what does our soul life consist of now? It consists of the stream flowing from the past into the future, meeting another stream flowing from the future into the past. Since that meeting constitutes the soul life of the present moment, you can easily understand that those two streams come together or overlap, so to speak, within the soul. Th that overlap is consciousness. 
There is no other explanation for consciousness than this. That is how the soul participates in everything flowing from the past into the future and from the future into the past. You can say, whenever you look into your soul life, that you are involved with an interpenetration of those two streams, what flows from the past into the future, and the opposite flow of desires, interests, wishes, and so on. The two streams interpenetrate each other. We will use two different terms in referring to these two currents, since they are so clearly different. If I were addressing an audience as though there were no spiritual scientific movement, I would choose the strangest names possible to represent those streams. The names are unimportant. For now I will choose names that will remind you of things you are already familiar with from another angle. You can then study them from two sides. One is the viewpoint of pure empiricism, which describes soul phenomena according to the way they occur on the physical plane. It can thus choose the names it likes, based on what it finds. And then you examine them on the basis of esoteric investigation. Let us look at the second side. Names are unimportant here, although I prefer to choose such names as someone does who looks at things from a clairvoyant perspective, and thus in fact really observes the meeting of these two currents. Such names would be derived from spiritual science. You will rediscover in psychosophy, what you have learned from spiritual science. Accordingly, we will call the current that momentarily carries unconscious mental images those that flow from the past into the future, the etheric body. The other stream which flows from the future into the past and intersects the first stream and becomes congested with it will be called the astral body. And what is consciousness? It is the mutual com coming together of the etheric and the astral bodies from their two sides. Try testing this. Apply everything you've learned from investigations of clairvoyant consciousness about the etheric and the astral bodies to what has been said here. You will be able to do that and will recognize there, again, the truths with which you are familiar. You will only need to ask what causes the intersecting or damming up. Something congests because the two streams encounter each other in the physical human life. Now imagine removing the physical and etheric bodies. This is the case after death, when the current flowing from the past into the future is no longer present. When that occurs, the current pressing from the future into the past, that of the astral body, becomes free and asserts itself in a direct manner after death. Consequently, life in Kamaloka flows in reverse, as I have told you. You see, then, that we rediscover in psychosophy what we have learned from spiritual science. I hope, though, that you will notice one thing. There can sometimes be a long road to travel from knowledge of spiritual scientific truths gleaned from clairvoyant research to confirming experiences on the physical plane, for that must first be put in order. When that is achieved, you will see that everywhere you look, clairvoyant research is always confirmed by findings made on the physical plane. <clears throat> now let us go to another manifestation of our soul life, one usually known as surprise or wonder. When are we surprised? It is only when something confronts us that we are not immediately able to judge as it makes an impression on the soul life. In that moment when we are able to judge, surprise or wonder vanishes. At times when we are immediately able to judge, we feel no surprise, no wonder. Thus we can say that the future forces itself into our soul life when we are confronted by a phenomenon and are consequently surprised. When something makes a conscious impression upon the soul, without the immediate occurrence of a judgment. Or we may even feel fear, since that feeling too may be characterized as due to an inability to judge something that meets us. Feeling and interest are aroused, but judgment is not yet in a position to function.
This can convince us that our interests, feelings, or life of desiring cannot have the direction from the past into the future, because then judging would be able to flow directly from the same direction. <clears throat> judging must therefore be distinguished from interest. We have confirmed this by ordinary observation. Judging, however, is not the same as the current within soul life that flows from the past into the future. If it were, judging would have to coincide continually with the current of mental images. One's entire soul life would have to be active at every moment of exercising judgment. In every moment it would have to be finished with mental images. But judging is a conscious activity. Just consider, however, how remote you are at the moment of judging from a conscious possession of all the mental images you could have. Judging occurs in consciousness but cannot assume control of the ongoing flow of soul life. We do not always have all of our mental images at our beck and call. Judging, therefore, cannot coincide with the soul's onward flowing current, neither can it coincide with the current coursing from the future into the past. Otherwise that would render it impossible to experience such feelings as fear, surprise and astonishment. So we must conclude that judging coincides with neither of these directions. Keep this in mind as we examine the onward flowing stream of the etheric body as it moves from the past into the future. Its unique feature is that it is able to flow unconsciously through the soul and also become conscious. Let us see what can bring the unconscious mental images flowing through the soul into consciousness. We must bear in mind that these mental images are always present, but what happens at the moment when they become conscious? Consider a moment when mental images that have escaped us become conscious in a very unusual way. I will suggest such a moment. Assume, for example, that you are touring a picture gallery. You notice a picture and look at it. At that moment the same picture surfaces in your consciousness. Let us assume that you have already seen it. What has evoked that memory? It is the impression of the new picture, the impression of the new picture conjured into visibility within your soul, the old mental image of the picture that had continued to live within you. Let me read that sentence again. What has evoked that memory? It is the impression of the new picture, the impression of the new picture conjured into visibility within your soul, the old mental image of the picture that had continued to live within you. If you had not seen the new picture, the old mental image would not have surfaced. <clears throat> we can come to a clear understanding of this matter only when we realize something. What happened when you saw that new picture? Your I being wanted to approach the picture and it used the senses as a medium. Because your I, capital, received a new impression and absorbed a new element, which had a curious effect on something in the ongoing flow of your soul life, your soul life became visible. Let us try to form a picture of this process. Think of all the objects that are behind you when you face a certain direction. You cannot see them because they are behind you. You can see them only when you hold a mirror. You can then see the objects behind you in the mirror. We can conclude that something very similar must be the case when the mental images living on unconsciously in the soul. With, so let me read that again. We can conclude that something very similar must be the case with the mental images living on unconsciously in the soul. When a new impression comes, it affects the soul's life, so that the old impression becomes visible in the soul. If you think of the I as something in the soul's life that stands with the old, unconscious mental images behind it, the moment of remembering may be characterized as mental images being induced to reflect themselves through an inner soul process. 
In that, a cause for that reflection is created. Then you have the process of memory, of the becoming aware of old mental images. <clears throat> Why does such mirroring occur? You will easily discover this just by thinking about it. You will find the reason such a reflection occurs when you remember a point referred to recently in my public lecture titled On Life and Death, footnote lecture of October 27, 1910, contained in Antworten der Geisteswissenschaft auf die großen Fragen des Das Eins, uh, CW 60, not translated into English, and a footnote. We can observe something extraordinarily important in the life of the soul, that the backward-running memory goes back only to a certain point, beyond which it stops. And we cannot recall anything further. Memory begins at that point. We might ask what kind of mental images are usually recalled. They are only those in which the I has participated, in which the I was truly involved. I have said before that memory goes back to the moment a child gains the capacity to conceive of the self as I, when the child develops I awareness. Ordinarily, we are able to recall only those mental images with which the I was actively engaged, in which the active power of a self-aware I being was involved. What happens in an I being in the process of being, quote-unquote, born during a child's second or third year. Before that, children unconsciously absorb impressions without the I being truly present in them. They then begin really to develop I consciousness, relating to it all the mental images that they absorb from the outer world. That is the point when the human I situates itself in front of its mental images, placing them behind it. It is an almost physically perceptible event. First, the eye was within its life of mental images. It then steps out, free and armed to accept everything coming to meet it from the future, while placing the past mental images behind it. Using this as a background, what must then happen? Excuse me. Using this as a background, what must then happen at the moment the I begins to be conscious, begins to take all the mental images into itself? The I must then form a connection with the onward flowing current that we have referred to as the etheric body. Now, at the moment children begin developing I awareness, the current of the soul life imprints an impression of itself on the etheric body. That is the source of the I image. If you think about it, you will see that the I image can never be given to you from outside. All other mental images with any relationship to the physical world come from outside. The I image, on the other hand, or even the perception of the I, can never come to you from outside. That will become clear if you consider a child's incapacity to sense its own etheric body before having an image of the I. <clears throat> as soon as a child begins to develop I consciousness, it feels its own etheric body and reflects the being of this etheric body back into the I. The child then possesses the required mirror. Whereas all other mental images related to physical space and life on the physical plane are received through the physical body, that is, through the sense organs, I consciousness arises because the I fills the etheric body and reflects itself, as it were, on its inner quote unquote, walls. The essential thing about I consciousness is that it is the inward reflecting of the etheric body. What prompts the I to take on such a process of inward mirroring? The only possible cause is that the etheric body comes to a certain closure. We saw that the astral body comes toward the etheric body. It is the I that fills out the etheric body and becomes conscious of it, as if through an inner mirroring. 
This eye image or eye awareness has a certain characteristic. It is taken hold of powerfully by all interests and desires, for they anchor themselves firmly in the I. Despite the egoism represented by such interests and desires, there is certainly something unique about this self-perceiving of the I. In a certain sense it is independent of the desires. There is a certain demand that the human soul places upon itself that we can easily verify in ourselves. Every soul says to itself, I cannot possibly summon my I being only through desiring. No matter how much I might wish it, wishing does not make it happen. The I no more consists of the current of desires flowing from the future into the past than it does of the ongoing flow of mental images. It is something radically different from both streams, but nevertheless it assimilates them both. We can represent this in a diagram completely true to the facts by drawing the line of the I current perpendicular to the time streams. It must be drawn this way to provide a correct picture of the various soul manifestations involved. We remain true to the facts by illustrating the activity of the I as a current that is perpendicular to the two time currents. This corresponds to the I aspect. <clears throat> now, there is an element related to the I that self-observation readily discerns as well the capacity for judging. It enters the soul with the I. You can easily understand this through a feeling such as surprise. If the I works in from the side, an event can approach you that can bring you an abundance of interest. But if the judging activity of the I cannot enter from the side at the same time, then the event cannot meet with the judgment. What happens, then, when the I comes in laterally? We have seen that the I perception is an inner mirroring in the soul. Such mirroring would have to occur in such a way that the mental images that flow in unconsciously would be literally behind the I. That would be the case if the I current, in fact, flowed in so that its own current entered in the direction of the line E to F, and that's up and down perpendicular in the previous drawing, but actually took the direction indicated here by the line GH, or toward the future. So from the perpendicular line inside the circle, there's a line moving to the right in the direction of the future. <clears throat> now, picture the eye itself becoming a mirror once it enters the etheric body. Which, fix, which fits the facts exactly. If the I has the flow of unconscious mental images behind it, what does it have in front of it, as it looks into the future according to its inherent nature? What would it be facing? Imagine standing before a mirror and gazing into it. If the back of the mirror isn't coated, you see nothing reflected at all. You would be staring into the unending distance. Our perception of the future is like that. This is indeed how we look into the current that approaches us from the future. It flows toward us, but we don't see anything. When do we see something there? We see only what is there from the past. We do not see the future, of course, but we do see the past. You don't see objects in front of you as you look into a mirror. You see only what is behind you. At the moment a child attains self-awareness, as the result of the I entering the etheric body, the I mirrors itself inwardly. From that point on, all soul life is a co-reflecting of experiences and impressions. And this also explains why we are unable to remember anything that happened before the eye acquired its mirroring capacity. A child's earliest impressions are not remembered. 
The important thing is that the human eye, to the extent that it has entered the etheric body, or to the extent that it receives mental images from the past, becomes, through this, a mirror within the soul. After that, it is open to whatever appears in its mirror. What has to happen to make it possible for the I really to mirror the past? We could say that if we have an external impression, such as I described, such as seeing a picture again that we have seen before, it evokes a reflection in connection with the previous mental picture that we were unconscious of at the time. As the earlier mental image radiates in from the other side, it is restrained so that it falls on the inner mirror of the soul. But when there is no new impression or a repetition of an earlier one, the eye itself must produce what the mirroring should provide. It must work from the other side and create a substitute for what an external impression would have otherwise provided. What is then this I that is living itself out in our physical life? It is the inner fulfillment of the etheric body. Thus, in order for it to be able to mirror itself on the interior walls of the etheric body, it must make the etheric body itself into a mirror. This can happen only when the etheric body is complete. For external sense impressions, it is complete when you are in your physical body since that is when you are surrounded by your eyes, ears, and so on. Thus what lives within the etheric body can be reflected back. <clears throat> we must have another capacity, however, to allow for a free remembering, since the etheric body must have a quote-unquote mirror coating for purposes of reflection. The sense organs, the physical body in other words, provide such a coating for the reflection of new impressions. If, however, the physical body is not involved, as in the case of free remembering, when no new refreshing impressions are received, the coating must be taken from the other side. This is possible only when the primary resource is what counters the I from the side through the involvement of desiring as it flows toward us, which is used for a coating. Only through a corresponding strengthening of the astral body can we develop the forces for striving or desiring, which enable us to recall a mental image that resists reflection. Only by strengthening the I as it lives in the physical world can we pull in this stream that flows from the future, a stream we do not otherwise grasp and make it into a mirror coating. Thus only through strengthening the eye in this way, by making the eye master of the astral body, the stream issuing from the future, can we enable the eye to recall mental images that resist reflection. It is a battle we fight with the unconscious mental images. The eye lacks the strength to summon them, and so we must borrow something from what is coming toward us. To make this clearer, let me use an example from real life that will illustrate how we may strengthen the I. Usually we experience life's events by simply following the onward flowing stream of experiencing. If a bell rings once, then again, and then a third time, first you hear the first ring, then the second, then the third, but then you are finished. If you attend a play, you hear the individual parts one after another, and then you are done. In other words, you live with your etheric body in the onward flowing current. Let us suppose, however, that you deliberately try to become familiar with the current flowing in the opposite direction, reversing a sequence of episodes that are otherwise experienced only in the normal order. You decide, for example, to recall in reverse order some events of the day. If you review it backward, you are not following the ordinary flow of the I brought about by the I being living in the etheric body. Instead, you follow the opposite current 
or that of the astral body. If, for example, you pray the Lord's Prayer backward instead of in the usual forward sequence, you are proceeding counter to the usual current, the current resulting from the I filling out the etheric body. In this way you strengthen your I from the astral current. The result is a tremendous heightening of the capacity to remember. During my years of teaching, I worked to strengthen the memory of my students for later life by having them learn certain things in reverse order, things usually learned in only one direction, and having them practice this over and over. <clears throat> for example, the scale of hardness in minerals is usually learned as talcum, rock salt, marble, fluorite, apatite, orthoclase, quartz, topaz, corundum, diamond. In addition to having to recite the list in the usual order, the pupils had to be able to recite it in reverse order as well. That is an extraordinarily effective exercise for strengthening the memory, especially when started in a timely fashion in childhood. There is another exercise, one related to everything we have been talking about today and during the past several days. Imagine a man suffering from a severe loss of memory. He goes to the trouble of resuming with ardor some youthful interest or other. Let us say that this man, who is now forty-seven, was particularly intrigued by a certain book at the age of fifteen. He now decides to read it again. In such a case, if you call the same facts before your soul, a new current flows toward you, an astral current and you strengthen yourself from it as it flows toward you out of the future. If an elderly person carries out this exercise, deliberately repeating some activity pursued between the ages of seven and fourteen, it will be found to be very special, a, a very special aid to improving memory. These things can thus show that if the eye really wants to improve memory, it must strengthen itself out of the astral current flowing opposite to the etheric current. These things are all extraordinarily important for practical life. If educators paid more attention to them, it would result in tremendous blessings. If, for example, schools with seven grades were to arrange studies so that the fourth grade existed by itself, after which the fifth grade reviewed on a different level the material taken up in the third grade, the sixth grade reviewed the studies of the second grade, and the seventh grade reviewed the content of the first grade, great benefits would result. There would be a definite strengthening of memory, and people would see how beneficial such practices are, simply because they come from the laws of real life. This shows us that our I image or I consciousness is something that must first be created. It arises initially during early childhood from the etheric bodies reflecting in an inward direction. It comes as no surprise for those who know spiritual science, since they realize that the human being is outside the physical and etheric bodies in the night, to hear that I consciousness cannot exist at night because the eye is then unable to reflect itself in the etheric body. Thus we are not at all surprised that the image of the eye submerges into the subconscious during sleep, since the etheric body is the onward running stream of time. It contains the mental images that must first be illuminated from the other side by the astral body, then what swims forward, so to speak, in the etheric body can be illuminated by the soul's life. The image we have of our own I being is really only in the etheric body. In fact, it is only the entirety of the etheric body as seen from within. The I image is active only in the etheric body. But this does not apply to the I itself, for as stated, the I is the power of judging that enters laterally. You cannot grasp the I by looking to I consciousness. You must turn to judging. Although it seems odd, judgment reveals itself as a higher order than I consciousness. 
A very exact distinction has been drawn between what is and is not taken hold of by judging. Perceiving the color red does not yet involve any judging by the soul. The capacity to judge is not yet functioning. What decides about the impression rushes in from outside. At the moment of making the simplest judgment, such as red is, ascribing existence to the color, the soul life passes judgment. The eye arouses itself in that moment when we judge. When the eye judges on the basis of the results of external impressions, those impressions participate in the judgment, becoming the object of the judgment, as in red is. <coughs> What must then be possible if the eye is an entity distinct from its mental images and also from perception of itself? What must be present for the eye to be the cause of eye perception? There must be a possibility of judging. Among the various judgments in our soul life, there has to be one that is independent of any external impression over which the eye is master. This is the situation when you state the judgment I is or I am. There you have what lives as yet unconsciously in the I, filled with the ability to judge in I is or I am. You have filled out with the power of judgment what was previously an empty bubble that dissolves like foam when the soul's life becomes unconscious. If that is the case, if the I fills itself out, what happens then? Judging is a soul activity, and soul activities originate in the innermost life of the soul. They lead to mental images. It is in the realm of these images that the I image surfaces. But we have been unable to learn anything about the I itself from the I image. One thing now becomes clear, however. No external impression can supply us with the image of the I. In other words, the image does not come from the physical world. Since it is not a product of the physical world, but otherwise has exactly the same character as mental images that do originate there, and since judging, which is part of the elementary content of the soul, is applied to the I, the I must enter the life of the soul from some other quarter. In other words, just as the mental image red enters the soul from the outer world and is encompassed by the I through judgment, so also something comes into the soul from the other side that is encompassed by judgment. <clears throat> Let us take the impression red and encompass it with a judgment. We end up with red is. Similarly, let us take the I and say, I is. Here we have an impression derived from that outer world we call the spiritual world, and we encompass it with the judgment. Excuse me. Here we have an impression derived from that outer world we call the spiritual world, and we encompass it with a judgment. Red as such corresponds to the forms of existence in the physical world, whereas red is, is a judgment and can originate only within the soul life. I is a fact in the same sense that red is. It can enter the soul life or, in other words, be encompassed by a judgment only when the judgment approaches the soul from the other side, encompasses the I with the judgment, and says, I am, or I is. The genius of language is very wise, and expresses things precisely, reversing the is from outside the human being, and making it the am of I am from within. If I now include the fourth direction from J to K, and that's from below upward, physical body, below upward. Let me read that again. If I now include the fourth direction, the line J to K from below upward, I would have to describe it as the direction of the physical world running counter to that of the I. 
it represents the current of the physical body. Presented graphically, the impressions of the physical world move thus from below upward and manifest themselves in the soul as sense impressions. On the one side is the eye, placed counter to its sense organs in the physical body. On the other side, the current of the etheric body opposes that of the astral body. When the eye collides with the physical body, streaming against the eyes or against the ears, it receives impressions of the physical world. These impressions are brought further into the soul through the consciousness that arises from the counter-flowing of the astral and etheric worlds. You will realize from the whole picture that a fairly good representation is afforded of the relationship of the various worlds working together in the human soul when one says that on the one side the eye and the physical body with its sense organs confront each other in opposite directions. They stand directly across from each other. Then the, two, the other two currents, those of the astral and etheric bodies, also oppose each other in that they form right angles, as it were, to both of the other currents. I can assure you that innumerable riddles of the soul will be solved for you if you refer to this diagram. You will see that this cross, cut by a circle, provides an excellent picture of the life of the soul showing how it borders on the spiritual world above and on the physical world below, on the etheric to the left and on the astral to the right. This requires rising to a concept of time as a current that does not just flow quietly along, but that meets with something. The life of the eye and the senses, on the other hand, can be understood only when they are seen coming into contact with the stream of time at a right angle. If you keep this in mind, you will understand that very different forces really meet in our souls, which is the scene of an encounter of forces moving in the most varied directions. Let us assume that we are dealing with an individual, since these forces manifest themselves in a great variety of ways in the great variety of human beings in whom the judging I prevails. Such a person will find it extremely difficult to fill abstract thoughts with enough life blood so that they appeal directly to the feelings. Thus we can expect that it will not be easy to get something life-filled to engage our feelings out of what a person says whose primary soul activity is judging. On the other hand, the kind of individual whose soul life tends toward a flow rich in interests and astral abundance, which encounters the opposite ongoing stream of physical life, brings a disposition for vivid concepts into life. Such individuals will not turn up on the physical plane as thought people, but they may be characterized by the ease with which they express inner experiences in ways that capture our interest. Since we incarnate repeatedly and bring with us a tendency to this or that predisposing current, we can picture the soul of Goethe as predisposed to the current coming from the future. If he surrenders to it, then from the beginning he brings life-filled concepts from the future into life. If, however, he allows this element, which is truly his own, to battle a soul content absorbed from his environment, a content that goes floating along in his etheric body as mental images beneath the threshold of his consciousness, the result is a disharmony like the two elements we talked about in his poem titled The Eternal Jew, the useless one and the one we emphasized. In the case of someone like Hegel, who brought a judging predisposition with him, such an individual constantly wrestles with everything that streams toward him from the future into the past. The eye is placed in such a way that the ongoing stream from the past into the future is always hidden at each present moment. The eye hides it, but it is open to the counterflow of the stream of the capacity of desiring. 
the eye, looks into the never-ending future as though into an uncoated mirror. As soon as the mirror receives a coating, the past experiences become visible. It has been possible in these lectures to discuss only a few aspects of the infinite wealth of psychosophy, but if you ponder them, you will be able to draw many conclusions from what has been said. Much will become clear if you keep in the background the fact that the stream of soul life flowing from the past into the future, that of the etheric body, contains the unconscious mental images which are present despite their unconscious state. If you know from spiritual science that the etheric body is the architect of the physical body, you will be able to see that these mental images are indeed present, even if unconsciously, for the etheric body carries them along. And the mental images pre present there are capable of developing a lively activity toward the other side, especially if they are unconscious. Anyone versed in physiology and psychology is aware how profoundly disturbing mental images can be when they cannot be summoned from the soul's depths into consciousness, but instead continue to swim along with the etheric current in those unconscious depths of the soul life. They then generate all their strength into the physical body. Here is a relevant fact in life. Let us consider, for example, someone between the ages of ten and twelve who has experienced an event that has been totally forgotten and simply cannot be recalled. This experience, nevertheless, continues to work in the etheric body and can make the person sick. Below the surface of consciousness, many mental images are active that can cause illness. Those who are aware of this fact also know that there is, in a certain way, help for it. It consists of taking away the power of such images. This means leading them to another direction by trying to provide to the sufferer, who is not strong enough to do this alone, reference points that allow these, those images to surface. This is of tremendous help. To assist a person in bringing to consciousness mental images over which the individual is powerless, images that continue to work in the etheric body, can have a truly curative effect. Some of you are perhaps saying that that is already being tried. There is indeed a school of psychiatry, the Freudians, based on recalling to consciousness past actions and experiences. I cannot equate this school's approach, however, with what I have just suggested, since it applies the method in the very place it does not belong. <clears throat> it is namely ineffective, precisely with the sum total of the mental images related to sexual life. In every other kind of situation it is valid. The Freudians, however, extended with predilection to the treatment for mental images of a sexual nature where it is, in fact, useless. This must be recognized. The point is not that we go tapping around under the influence of materialistic concepts and come across something that the facts have already discovered, but that we know exactly what the facts are. Perhaps you can thus add something more to the other remarks you will take with you. If we observe conscientiously and with discrimination ordinary life here on the physical plane, we can see that everywhere it confirms the findings of spiritual science. Lectures like these will help give you confidence in information based on the findings of clairvoyant research though such research certainly does not search the physical plane for the facts it presents. <clears throat> I can assure you that clairvoyants themselves are often surprised when they test the results of their supersensible research at the confirmation they find in physical life. Taking the opposite direction would probably not have succeeded. Remaining on the physical plane leads to associating things incorrectly and results in misinterpretation of the facts. Thus, the basic feeling, that of certainty in relation to spiritual scientific research, can also give you confidence in the research of psychosophy. This is why I occasionally try to give you a dry, dispassionate account of supersensible matters, 
in such a way that it meets the criteria of the objective scientific investigation of the physical plane. As a result, we are obligated to note that human beings are put on the physical plane for the purpose of understanding it. Our time has two tasks. One is to study in selfless, objective thinking this physical plane on which the great cosmic laws have placed us for a purpose. On the other hand, we are at a stage today at which we can no longer master the physical plane by ordinary means if help is not provided through esoteric research. No matter how wisely ordinary science advances, it cannot avoid erring without the guidance and direction provided by esoteric science. After the human race reached the turning point of the 15th through the 17th centuries and began to emphasize research, <coughs> when modern physical research began, we progressed and are now again at a point where a different esoteric kind of research will have to assist and direct physical research. To the extent that esoteric researchers not only know this, but also accept it as their duty, they fulfill what must be a dual requirement of modern times. They develop the sense that we must stand firmly upon the physical plane, fearless of the selfless activity of thinking. Physical reality in particular demands it. The intent of these lectures and my dry presentation has been to nurture just such a sense. On the other hand, you have learned much for life if you have absorbed the concept of how the astral stream coming from the future plays its role. I must admit that I could almost prove these things from the sense-perceptible world. I addressed this matter on another occasion elsewhere. Among all modern psychologists, who, without any interest in esotericism, have sensitively approached the phenomena of the soul and have therefore, if in a lopsided way, come to a real sense for the most basic facts, only Franz Brentano's name deserves mention. Footnote. Franz Clemens Brentano, 1838-1917, to German philosopher, Catholic priest and professor. He wrote, an, he wrote on psychology, Aristotle, logic and ethics. See Steiner's memorial essay on Brentano in titled Riddles of the Soul. End of footnote. In the 1860s and 1870s, Brentano devoted himself to a study of psychological problems. Although his writing on the subject is a scholastic brooding, it contains something that reminds one of a child's first steps, which we would like to pursue further. What he said about desiring and feeling, as well as about judging, misses the mark. The tendency, however, could have led straight to the mark if he had not been so completely ignorant of the esoteric aspects of these matters. The most capable psychologist has stepped onto the physical plane, so to speak. The first volume of his title, Psychology, appeared in the spring of 1874, with a second volume promised to follow in the autumn. The second volume has yet to appear. Only the first is available. What is the explanation? You will find the answer in the lectures on psychosophy. He got stuck and could not continue. He had made a nice outline of the chapters yet to come. He even intended to include a view of spiritual life and immortality from the perspective of the I. It was all outlined, but there he got stuck. Esoteric research would have had to be called in from the other side so that soul phenomena would be examined from the perspective of esoteric research. This example proves that Franz Brentano was a child of our time. He began to categorize the facts available on the physical plane, and then he got stuck. He is an old man now, living in Florence. Everything today will have to become stuck in this way when it has to work with reality. The psychologies of Wundt and Lips, for example, can of course be written but they are based on preconceived notions rather than on actual processes in soul life. Footnote, Theodor Lips, 1851-1914, German philosopher and a professor. He developed a theory of aesthetics based on empathy. Wilhelm Wundt, 1832-1920, German physiologist and psychologist, considered the founder of our experimental psychology. 
Having studied under Johannes Müller, he went on to become a professor and establish the first psychological laboratory. Believing that psychology must be based directly on experience, he developed a methodology of introspection. End of footnote. They are based on the preconceived opinions of the authors. It is precisely when they set out into the psychological realm, even in what they have to say on social psychology and linguistics, that they thresh mere empty straw. This is not meant to be unkind, but only to express it clearly. All the branches of science will suffer the same fate if they fail to greet what comes to meet them from the other side. From this side understand that through your own interests you have joined a movement whose goal is to comprehend the mission of our time. Understand also that your confidence, insight and faith can grow if you comprehend this as manifested karma. Tell yourself that karma has led you to be present and active at the crossroads of a stream of time and that you must become courageous, strong and confident. This insight should be a source of strength to cooperate energetically in this sphere. And this effort must bear fruit because the human progress demands it. One's own participation will provide the opportunity to work selflessly now or in a future for the further evolution of all humanity. This brings us to the greatest ideal that those who believe in spirit may feel. Think of this not as an abstract ideal, but acquire it through persistently returning to our spiritual scientific work. Ample opportunity is given for this in our gatherings. Take away with you a sense that you belong to this work. If you have done anything that can give you such a feeling, it will accompany you on your return home and be a greeting to those scattered in various places. Take it as an emanation of the strength of the unity that should exist among all the members of our spiritual scientific movement. You should feel this even when you, we are not together physically. As we depart to various parts of the world, try to draw courage, confidence and energy from our time together here.